it's been a minute since we've seen this. NASA had some of the best optical tracking cameras known to man, and they didn't let them go to waste. This is footage of the Space Shuttle Endeavor maneuvering to recover at the Shuttle Landing Facility in Florida. It's descending through 80,000 feet at Mach 2.5. Wouldn't it be kind of interesting to have a beer with someone involved in operating that thing? Sure it would, and he's right here in the Zoom room. That's Paul Dye in, in the other window, and uh, we're going to have a beer. What are you drinking, Paul? Uh, let's see. I'm drinking uh, Flying Dog Pale Ale. Oh, I, got a I got a Peroni. So uh, <laughs> Paul Dye, uh, most of you probably know, but in case you don't, he was a uh, senior flight director at NASA for many years. He uh, flew the shuttle and flew the International Space Station, and that's the term uh, that they use. You fly it even though you're not flying. So we looked at this uh, footage, uh, Paul, and since we're having our beers here, um, tell me about uh, bringing the shuttle home. Um, this is something uh, that you can't do casually. No, uh, it, take, no. it takes a lot of, and we, and we know by bitter experience that things can go wrong. So, so how did this, how did the bringing the shuttle uh, home start? Yeah, so you start off uh, the entry portion. Of course, you're in orbit, and, and in orbit, you're up around uh, 100, at least 100 nautical miles, or probably 200 nautical miles, and you're doing 25,000 feet per second, or about 18,500 miles an hour. And um, you've got to take all that energy out that you put in during the the launch phase. And, you know, you watch the launch phase and you see all that fire and smoke. I mean, we basically blow people into orbit and you got to take all that energy back out. So um, you would start with what's called a deorbit burn and uh, you'd, you'd put the vehicle backwards in orbit and you'd light off the, the orbital maneuvering system engines, which are on the back to slow you down. And you have to slow down about 200 and 250 feet per second and change, something like that, um, so that you would start descending. And once you start descending, and you did that burn over the Indian Ocean, something like that, if you were headed for Edwards. And then you'd start, you'd come out of your circular orbit, you'd be descending. And when you hit about 80 nautical miles altitude, you started getting enough atmosphere that it starts to continue to slow the vehicle down from drag. So that's when you get captured. So you got to get above 80 nautical miles to stay in orbit. So below 80,000 feet or 80, 80 nautical miles, you're coming down. Um, in order to do that, the way the heat shield was designed, you basically had to maintain an angle of attack of 40 degrees, plus or minus about a degree, maybe a degree and a half. Um, but you also wanted to be able to modulate where you were going to land. So if you were just ballistic and you just threw a ball or you threw the orbiter, it was going to land at a certain spot, depending on the aerodynamics. But you want to be able to extend that by, by, by stretching the glide, so to speak, or land shorter if you're going long. And so to do that, you had to maintain that same angle of attack. But you could vary the lift by rolling off the vehicle and tilting the lift vector and essentially slipping. Um, you're, you're actually turning. And so the air is so thin that the turn is very, very broad. We're talking a radius of, hundred, of, of, of um, thousands of miles. But you turn, 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 turn. Um, and you vary that, angle, that, that bank angle to vary your, your sink rate to get on the trajectory you wanted. And then when you when you get off of the, the direct path to your landing site by a, enough degrees, you reverse the roll. So you reverse it. So you're, you could be up to 90 degrees of roll. So you're just falling out of the sky or you're 60 degrees, something like that. So you do a couple of big S turns across the Pacific. Um, one of our commanders one time, I was chatting to him over a beer after, uh, after the mission. And he said, yeah, you know, we went past Hawaii in a left bank about about 80 degrees and he looked out his window and he said Hawaii went by we were about 250,000 feet he said Hawaii went by like a signpost on the highway we were moving <laughs> so fast and his only thought was how are we ever going to get this thing slowed down by the time we get to the west coast but that that drag increases as you as you sink in and you have a lot of heating going on so that the heat shield's taking all that heat out all that energy out and it slows you down. Um, when the number I can I can quote when we were when we lost the Columbia, 
when we were going over Dallas, headed for Florida landing, we were doing about Mach 18. That's when it broke up. And so that's kind of the, the speed you're doing. And you've got to kill all that speed before you get down into the into the terminal area. Once you're below about 200,000 feet, you're through most of that entry heating and you're starting to really um, try to try to make change it from a from a rock that's been thrown into the atmosphere into an airplane. And uh, um, was the uh, was the uh, uh, angle of attack and maneuvering uh, thermally limited at all? Yes, it was thermally limited, and it was drag limited, and it was G limited as well. Now, the, the Gs would, would hap, happen later later in the thing, but you wanted to make sure that you didn't over-G the vehicle, and it was a very low G vehicle. It was a 3G vehicle, um, so this wouldn't even meet utility category uh, uh, certification standards. Um, and so all those things had to play in, and we had various computer phases of the entry uh, of the hot section, and it would try to optimize different things while still always making sure that the landing site is reachable in the footprint, if that makes sense. Uh, how did you uh, monitor the trajectory? Um, the, the, the vehicle was basically flying to a, uh, the nav was being done with the inertial measurement units. So the inertial measurement units in the vehicle were keeping track of where it was. Um, when you got lower, we would have a GPS that we could take. We eventually would take TATANs uh, and the like to, to refine the position because during the during the period between the deorbit burn where you aligned the IMUs just before to the stars, and when you got down lower, you could get some error in there. So if you ever listen to the to the detail of the air to ground, you'll hear the ground telling the crew, okay, take GPS to nav. Uh, take TACANs to NAV or take it to guidance and things like that. So that's when we're starting to incorporate external sensors into the package. Did they hand fly most of that? No, actually, um, we only did one hand flown entry in the history of the program. Uh, and basically, we, we let the computer fly it down to about Mach 1. Uh, and then we would take over by hand at Mach 1. And the reason for that, uh, for taking over, was A, no self-respecting test pilot who's been given the chance to land the shuttle is going to let the computer do it. Um, that's the, the running joke. But but the, the auto land would land the vehicle perfectly 999,000 times out of uh, 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 almost every time. But there was always that one little thing where you, you'd where you'd worry that in the flare you might have a problem, and you've been on you've been on orbit in weightless conditions for a week to two weeks, you haven't flown anything for that amount of time. Your your internal gyros are messed up. Your sense of of seat of the pants are messed up, and so we didn't want somebody in that condition to suddenly get into that 50 feet in the flare and have to take over and fly. So you wanted to start flying at about Mach 1, so you kind of get your flying legs back, so that by that time you get down low, if anything wasn't one the way you wanted it, you could just land it. And so once we took over, you generally just hand flew it from about about Mach 1 to the to the ground. So most of those landings were hand flown. They were all hand flown. Yeah, all hand flown. Yeah. Uh, I asked you uh, before we we started recording what you worried most about, and it was the uh, the hot portion of the entry yeah you know there's always that fear that that there's something going to go wrong with a with the tiles with a heat shield and the like as we we're proven with with columbia um but but there's so little that you can do if that kind of thing goes wrong in mission control we train for failures i mean just failure after failure after failure failure response come up with a creative idea and during that part of dynamic flight there are things that can go wrong that there's simply nothing you can do about, as as was Columbia and and as was the ascent uh, failure on Challenger, and that really gnaws at you when you realize that with all the training and all the practice and everything you did, that there's nothing you can do in that case. The hot portion is really up to the computer to fly, and uh, you've got to make sure that the that the heat shield uh, is is intact. And if it's not, you're in trouble. And if it is, then you can start worrying down the way to make sure all the systems keep working. During uh, the entry phase, you have no communication and no telemetry? Well, yes, but I'll give you that a qualified yes to the sometimes no. The, so 
in the early part of the program, all of the contact we had was through ground sites. And if you remember Apollo and Gemini and Mercury, there was always this blackout portion of entry. And that's because you had this hot plasma coming off the heat shield between you and the antennas that were on the ground trying to look through it. And it was, you couldn't get data or voice through that. Once we launched the tracking and data relay satellite network, which is sitting out in the geosync uh, orbit, we could actually look at the top antennas on the shuttle and actually maintain a lot of the data through what used to be the blackout. So it was more of a gray out with a few spots of black. So we had an awful lot more communication through that. And, and it depended on the exact trajectory and blah, 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 and how the antennas were pointed. But, but um, in the early days, we, we had a true blackout for minutes at a time. And in, in the later days, it didn't last anywhere near as long. Now, I live on the west coast of Florida when the shuttle was flying. Uh we would hear the sonic booms when it crossed uh, the west coast of Florida. And, you know, you, you, it was pretty loud. And uh, you wouldn't, you know, we weren't paying attention to when the shuttle was flying. You'd hear the booms. Oh, that's the shuttle going in. So it would cross the west coast of Florida at what, 100,000 feet or something? Uh, probably or 150. 150. And then I have, at, to look, I have to look it up, yeah. At that point, it's in the pattern, right? Pretty much. Almost. I mean, you know, I'll just add, we heard the sonic booms one time in Houston on an early morning entry to, to the Cape. And none of us could believe it. So we went back and did the math of the speed of sound as it varies from 400,000 feet down. And we said, yep, that was it. So, yeah, that's a strong shock. But, yeah, you're, you're, you're virtually in the pattern. When you cross over the west coast of Florida, you fly in Florida all the time. You know you can practice. You don't have to get very high to be able to see both coasts. Yeah. Right? And um, we also always used to joke. People said, oh, they have all these big, you know, restricted airspace. So we didn't really need a restricted airspace because if you're going to do a circle to land, so you're going to cross over midfield and do a 270 <laughs> land, you're coming over midfield at 55,000 feet. You're already above, <laughs> you're over the middle of the field and you're still above the airliner pattern. So mm -hmm. you didn't need much restricted airspace because you were coming in the top of it. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, would it typically then, if it crossed over the field, then it would enter what we would consider a downwind? Yeah. So let's say you were going to land um, to the southeast um, and uh, you'd come in from the west. And so you'd, you'd basically cross over kind of a midfield um, and then and then turn into a downwind. And so you'd be over midfield at Mach 1 and 50,000 feet. You're dropping at 10,000 feet a minute. Um, so when you're at low key, which is opposite the numbers on downwind, you're at about um, 30,000, uh, excuse me, uh, um, uh, yeah, 30,000. When you're on what we would call a base in GA, it would be 20,000. And then as you turn final, uh, you'd intercept the glide slope at about 12,000. And you're dropping it about 10,000 feet a minute. And, and it doesn't vary very much because there's so little air that the, the, wing, the wing isn't breaking the yeah. ball. The wing is there to flare pretty much. Right. Yeah, they uh, on the on the tape you hear uh, on at 180 and on at 90. What that means right. that that you're on the so glide path. On energy, on glide slope. Yeah, basically you're on all the parameters that we want. So yeah, you're on the right altitude and at the right energy state. On at the 180, on at the 90, and then on, on then on when you're when you're. And, and how long was that final? Uh, in time or the, the uh, final distance. was about five six miles. Okay, and that's uh, what that's under a minute, isn't it? Yeah, it's about a minute, about a minute. Okay. To, to touch down, something like that. Yeah. And then uh, at that fast. at that point, uh, you're committed with no no options really, or, or do they carry oh, yeah. a little more energy to to have something to play with? Or? You've got you've got you've always got you're always you always maintain a positive energy state so we fly the final like most glider pilots know it's a glider you fly with the speed brakes out so that if you start losing energy going below the amount of energy you need to make the touchdown point you can close the speed brakes up it's kind of like a throttle It'll, matter of fact we use the same lever in the cockpit to throttle the engines during ascent or modulate the speed brake uh, on on final um, and so you always maintain, you always wanted to have enough energy so that you were always above positive. So you're never going to land short. Um, and uh, we were, we were launching weather balloons for hours before the, before entry. And then after 
entry. We were still launching them. So we knew what the upper winds were going to be so that we wouldn't get surprised by, uh oh, I mean, a strong wind. I don't have enough energy to make a field. And would that data be loaded into the flight computer in the shuttle? Uh, not really. It would be read up to the crew. I mean, before entry, we would tell them the winds and they would write down the winds on their on their on their knee pad. And if we needed to and we would pick the the approach we were going to use. So we preferred to use that that left or right overhead, so to speak. Um, and then if you got because that gave you the most the most options if you ran low on energy. So let's say you were targeting a left overhead over, over the field, a left left circle um and you started realizing the winds were stronger or you'd gotten you'd wandered off and the guidance was bad um and we're going to be low on energy well you could just basically enter a right base for that same runway and not do that big circle out there so that saved you a lot of energy and if you got even lower than that you just close the speed brake and aim for the end of the runway and then line it up at the very end at the last little bit so um i've i've flown a lot of those variations in the simulator um because instructors like to screw with the old man so uh, <laughs> uh, did it um did it ever come up uh nervously short um i wouldn't say nervously but but notably once or twice there was there was a there was one at least one entry that ended up a little short but it was going to the lake bed at edwards so that wasn't a big deal now, if right. you look at kennedy oh, like uh kennedy is what twelve thousand feet or something like that Fifteen thousand feet. Fifteen. Yeah. So that was our standard uh, runway. Fifteen thousand. What does it? 300. What does it require for a rollout? Uh, requires an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> we had an abort landing option if we were gonna if, back when we were gonna launch out of Vandenberg to the south. One of the abort options was Easter Island, that I think had forty five hundred feet of runway, and you know you want to kind of you you wanted to. You wanted to drag the drag the mains through the palmetto grass on the approach end and and smoke the brakes and you probably would be stopped in the gravel at the far end. Um, we we said you needed about six thousand feet to roll out and you always landed about twenty four hundred twenty five hundred feet down from the threshold. So that's why we picked ten thousand foot runways or more. Yeah. So uh, the typical landing at Kennedy had plenty of runway. Plenty of room. Yeah. You know, there was a, it was, you'd touch down and you'd roll and roll and roll and roll and not even touch the brakes because if you were landing, if you were landing to the Southeast, the tollway was at the Southeast, was at the Southeast end. So you wanted to roll as close to that as you could. And the truck. What uh, would you describe was the uh, scariest thing you encountered when flying the shuttle? You know, the scariest thing systems wise, probably, uh, First off, the scariest things all happened in training because the, 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 the guys really, really stressed us. Um, the scariest thing for us probably was losing systems on your way downhill. So for instance, we had three auxiliary power units, each one that powered an, a, a hydraulic pump. And there was nothing auxiliary about it. They had to run or you didn't have any, any uh, flight controls. And you needed one and a half to have enough hydraulic capability to give you both pitch and roll control on touchdown. Um, and so, you know, if you lost one APU, you still had two left, you were good. Boy, if you lost another APU, you really were, you wanted to go to a lake bed if you could, because then you could just not care which direction you were pointed and you had enough hydraulics to flare. Um, that's a spooky thing. Um, but uh, as a general rule, you, you really wanted to make sure that you had good tracking so you knew where you were going. If there were any what we call dispersed trajectories, we could do a ground control approach where the guy in the front row, uh, our flight dynamics officer, would literally be telling the crew, turn now, turn, you know, it's just like a GCA in an airplane, um, if they really lost all the knowledge of where they were on board. And uh, you want to make darn sure that you had enough energy to make the runway. So do you miss flying that shuttle? I do. Uh, I, I I think that the shuttle was was the most amazing wing flying machine ever built. Um, and uh, you know, we, we always say that it could fly itself to a landing, and it could almost you know nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine times out of out of ten thousand. But um, we always wanted to have a pilot behind it, and 
I was very, very privileged to, to spend a lot of time in the simulators, uh, flying test stuff, and and then uh, at the end of my career, flying VIPs and people like that in the simulator. But um, I do miss it. I think it was a great machine, and and uh, it, it's hard to appreciate what it was like to fall out of the sky at that kind of rate. Um, we had two two reset points in every every simulator load one was the entry to to the to the ed, the standard left overhead to uh, the cape and the other was what we called 80k to edwards and if anybody who looks at a map looks at, at edwards air force base and you were going to land on uh runway four you started out at 80,000 feet over rosamond which is about <laughs> about 14 miles from the touchdown point and at 80,000 feet, you're pointed at that way. And you do one circle, one 360 circle to land. And, and you burn 80,000 feet doing that. And so we always told people when they started flying it, you know, you're going to make this big sweeping turn out there to land. You really, there was not big, you were just basically falling with style in this really tight spiral. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and at 80,000 feet, it was kind of fun because you'd come out of reset and if you just threw it over into a into a steep left bank and pulled, you didn't even change your trajectory. The air was so thin, you were still headed for Vegas. You know, <laughs> until you dropped into the dropped into the, enough atmosphere to actually have to give the wings something to bite. Um, I should mention here that for people who have not seen the shuttle uh, at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, the shuttle Atlantis is there and it is in a fabulous display. It's well worth the price of admission to appreciate. One, how big the shuttle actually was, and two, how how complex it was, because they've got the they've got the cargo bay open, and you can see inside it, and it's uh, quite a display. It it's a huge machine. We we used to joke with our Russian counterparts that if they ever had any booster problems, we could put a couple of their Soyuz capsules in the payload bay and carry them to orbit for them. Huh. Um, you know, that just gives you a size difference. But you're right. Uh, anybody who gets to Florida needs to go and see the Atlantis display. It brought tears to my eyes and choked me up. Uh, just the whole presentation of it was amazing. All right, Paul. Well, thanks very much. Uh, this is an interesting conversation, and I'm, I'm sure our viewers will appreciate it. All right. It was a pleasure chatting with you, as always. We've been speaking with Paul Dye, former senior NASA flight director, flew uh, the space shuttle and the International Space Station. I'm Paul Bertarelli for AvWeb. Thanks for watching.